Maybe. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. So, okay. Tonight we are very fortunate to have, have an old friend back on the podium. Greg Williams recently retired after 15 years on the district court bench, the last 10 as the first justice of the Edgartown District Court and as presiding justice of the Southern District of the Appellate Division, which decides appeals in civic, civil cases. Greg is a graduate of Western Maryland College, which is now known as McDaniel College, and Washington and the University of Law. He's now channeling his inner Ben Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, lucky for us, he enjoys uh, researching and presenting programs like we will here this evening. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by Lucy Loomis and Ben Santos. Lucy is a meeting tonight at Sturgis Library. She's the director there. But Ben is here. Next week, we will host Michael Tugas, who will talk about the untold story of the Cuban crisis, four incidences which almost led us into World War III. Now, I'm very, very pleased to present our old friend, not too old, but I've been around a while, Rachel Lewis. <laughs> so I appreciate the See that the uh, entry fee has gone up. I wanted to come here, so I got dressed up for it. Lots of that. Is it me or is it? It wasn't so recent that I retired, actually. You sound so I guess I'm trying to look back on how long ago it was. Very crisp. I retired in 2015, which was in seven years ago. So, in 1619, the English privateer White Lion transported to the colony of Virginia about 20 people. These were the first enslaved Africans, actually usually referred to as indentured servants, to come to what would become the United States. The Lion had actually captured these Africans from a Portuguese slave ship called the San Juan Bautista, which had been on route to Mexico. Uh, so they didn't, they didn't, they just captured them and brought them uh, African slavery then spread throughout the southern colonies. Uh, New England, fortunately, was a notably enlightened, chock full of abolitionists. So there were no enslaved African people here. So admittedly, New England eventually did profit from the Atlantic Triangle Treaties. And then the whole business, business ended with the Civil War. Long. Uh, certainly the part about New England and the part about the Gizmo business ending, uh, at least by the name of slavery. Before we go further, I would ask you to consider when you hear the term slavery, it, it usually, I think, strikes many of us in an abstract way. Uh, we certainly recognize it as bad, uh, awful, but it still hits us rather obliquely, I think, usually. Uh, try to keep in mind uh, the depths of the The depths of the to continue with the system of, of slavery. English traders, slave settlers, uh, began enslaving indigenous peoples early, certainly before Plymouth was established in 1620. Famously, in 1614, Thomas Hunt captured 20 to 24 indigenous people from Patuxet, which would become Plymouth, to sell them in Spain. Uh, one of those people was Squanto, usually known as Squanto. He was gone some five years and obviously then returned uh, back to these shores. After Plymouth in the 
Massachusetts Bay Colony were established, the enslavement of indigenous peoples continued, uh, usually during wartime. Wartime. Such as the vicious Pequot War of 1636-1639. Captives, indigenous people captives, were distributed among English settlers. Uh, they were also sold. Perhaps as many as a thousand of those captives were sold in the West Indies. In 1637, for example, the ship Desire, captained by William Pierce, transported 15 boys, uh, indigenous boys, and two indigenous women uh, captured in that war to the Caribbean. The following year, February uh, 1638, eight years after John Winthrop and his Puritans had uh, descended upon Boston, the desire was brought to the Massachusetts Bay Colony of the first reported enslaved African people in what would become Massachusetts. And the source for that is John Winthrop's journal. Now, English settlers didn't invent slavery, uh, they didn't invent uh, African slavery, it just wasn't really questioned by most people anywhere. These people who were brought here were purchased in the other Puritan colony, also established in 1630 place called Providence Island, which lies between Costa Rica and Jamaica. It is now part of Colombia. Keep in mind the continuing close relation between New England and the West Indies. Uh, that's obviously where the early cash crop sugar was. A few years later, 1641, Massachusetts became the first colony to formally recognize and authorize slavery. In a document called, ironically called, the Body of Liberties. Among other provisions that uh, that document legally permitted certain kinds of slavery. Uh, notably, slavery of what were called strangers who are sold to us. Uh, strangers is a term from, it will probably not surprise you to learn, Leviticus. Uh, that law also, though, purported to protect servants or slaves from inhumane, barbarous, or cruel punishments and abused servants. Always using that word, or usually using that word, servants instead of slave, slave people or slaves, could flee from the tyranny and cruelty of their masters to the house of any freeman of the same town without being charged as one of them. So that was a little bit on the good side. Now, given this legal blessing of chattel slavery, chattel slavery, commodified slavery, selling human beings. It is unsurprising that the slave trade flourished. I think I skipped one. Or I have not or, or if I got, forgot to put it in there. Anyway, it was a bunch of ads for, for the sale of slaves that appeared in Boston newspapers. It might, it might pop up at some point. Numbers are, are about the number of enslaved people here in Massachusetts, New England more generally. It, it's really tricky. Um, but between 1683 and about 1770, there were probably some 13,000 to 14,000 enslaved Africans brought to Massachusetts, uh, mostly from the West Indies. It is estimated that perhaps up to 20% of families in New England owned a slave or more by the late 17th century. And from 1754 to 1763, approximately 2% of the population were enslaved. And 
eventually stop putting my peas directly into that microphone. Uh, so there were nearly 4,500 enslaved people in the 1754 census. Most of them uh, lived in coastal towns, uh, some in early industrial centers. They were really not sizable plantations or farms in Massachusetts. There were in Rhode Island, but not as much here. So that's where uh, those people were employed. And because of that, most individuals or families did not own large numbers of enslaved persons. Uh, one or two. Which is one or two, two more. Enslaved people in New England uh, mostly lived, quote, better than plantation slaves in the South. Uh, they were not here routinely victims of incredible brutality, but they were enslaved. Enslaved is a slave. You are the property of somebody else. Despite the presence of slavery here, efforts to abolish it, or at least to curb it, began pretty early. Petitions to uh, legislatures, for instance, had been entertained in some colonies since the 1640s. Enslaved people here, though, but here, not by here, in Massachusetts, could also seek freedom in court. The first su uh, successful trial was in 1760. Oh, there's those ads I I'm working on this. What's in progress? The first successful trial of that kind was in 1766, a woman named Jenny Slew. She was a 43-year-old free woman in Ipswich, and she was kidnapped from her home by a guy named John Whipple Jr. and forced into servitude. She eventually uh, regained her freedom. She also gained from Mr. Whipple uh, money damages in the jury trial in sale. But the argument was pretty narrow. Her argument was that uh, her mother was white. And the uh, slave status was determined by the race of the person's mother and not her father. So her mother being white, uh, that was the factual issue of her uh, status. She was free. Um, so it was a white person's race who really was determined about the outcome of that matter. Um, let's look at this next slide. Of the world is so when revolutionary talk of freedom and equality, liberty, uh, the swirling in the 1770s, at least 20 petitions were filed in the Massachusetts legislature to abolish slavery. The first was by a, an enslaved gentleman named Felix, uh, and he had sort of a class action fight. He wanted all enslaved people in Massachusetts to be free, not just himself. Uh, and he sent that petition to the Governor's Council in 1773, but we don't know what happened. No responses. But it was the Massachusetts Constitution that would enable the continuing erosion of slavery in Massachusetts. Uh, that document, as you know, was principally drafted by John Adams. The Constitution of Massachusetts became effective on October 25, 1780, less than two and a half months before the birth of Lemuel Shaw, who we will get to. Article 1 of the Declaration of Rights, part of the Massachusetts Constitution, read in part, all men are born free and equal and have certain natural, essential, and unalienable rights. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that the, that the term men uh, was, was changed to people in 1976. In 1781, the year that Lemuel Shaw was born, an um, enslaved woman who was about 37 years old, known as Bet or Mumbat, uh, brought suit in Great Barrington. Anybody know where that is? 
Sometimes when you mention any place the rest of the most area, everyone's like, what? What are you talking about? Uh, Craig Barrington, and she uh, brought suit against her owner, Colonel John Ashley, based on that phrase, that all men, people, are born free and equal. And there's another uh, enslaved person named Ron who joined in that suit. The jury agreed, and keep in mind the jury's going to be white guys. The, and guys. Anybody know when the first women sat on a jury in Massachusetts? 1951. That was as a result of the statute passed the previous year. Um, anyway, they agreed that her enslavement was inconsistent with uh, the article in the Massachusetts Con and, and Constitution, and they awarded her her freedom plus five pounds, which now wouldn't be much, but back then it was probably a fair amount of money. She then became Elizabeth Freeman. Changed her name to Elizabeth Freeman. Now this case was pers uh, persuasive in a group of cases that you might know called Quack Walker. Uh, these were two civil and one criminal cases that arose in Worcester County. Uh, these all centered on an enslaved man named Quack Walker. Quack is spelled variously, usually Q. -U. Q-U-O-C-K, but sometimes with a K in the beginning. These culminated, these cases all came together when then Supreme Judicial Court Chief Justice William Cushing uh, declared that the free and equal language of the Massachusetts Constitution meant, quote, the idea of slavery is inconsistent with our own conduct and constitution. And there can be no such thing as perpetual servitude of a rational creature. And with that 1783 pronounced from the Supreme Court report, slavery uh, was deemed ended in Massachusetts. I say deemed ended, did it actually end? Well, let's just say that a lot of people can rush back to their enslaved people to advise them of this development. It took a, took a while for the for to get around that uh, it seemed as though the institution of slavery in Massachusetts had come to an end. It took a while. And by 1790, the federal census of Massachusetts recorded no enslaved people in Massachusetts. Uh, some, again, <coughs> magically transformed into indentured servants. Uh, Shaw, at that time, Noel Shaw, He's nine years old. So how does he get involved in this? this whole issue? Two ways. As for slavery, he decided numerous cases concerning the status of enslaved people who appeared in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, how they came to be here made all the difference. And uh, the segregation case that he famously decided was on the ground. Shaw, Lemuel Shaw. Lemuel Shaw was born in West Barnstable in January 1781, uh, toward the end of the American Revolution. The Battle of Yorktown, the last major land battle, would be that October. He was born in the parsonage, the house uh, that was built in 1693, in the second year of the Salem Witch Trials. That house still stands on Church Street, uh, about four miles from here in the Little West. Road. Uh, Shaw's father was Oakes Shaw. He was the pastor of whatever you want to call it, the 1717 meeting houses in the more recent term. Back then it was probably called the Rooster Church, uh, West Parish in, in West Boston. He was the pastor there for 47 years. <coughs> Shaw was sent to Harvard to mold him into yet another congregation as a pastor, but he fell in among lawyers. And he became one, uh, a highly successful one, mostly with uh, a commercial and corporate practice. He eventually bought the house on Vernon Street in uh, Boston. 
In his early years as a lawyer, Shaw was engaged to a woman named Nancy Rowe Melville. Uh, but she died in 1813 before they were married. Uh, and he carried uh, with him two letters that she had written to him in his wallet his entire life, uh, despite marrying twice. The picture on the left is only fairly recent, within the last, I say, three years, maybe, identified as Lemuel Shaw. There was a, that picture was put out on some kind of website, and I got a copy of it. And who do you think this is? I didn't think it was Lemuel Shaw, but apparently it was. Just, you know, anyway, that's it. Now, when the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court, not Shaw, died in 1830, Governor Levi Lincoln Jr. wanted Shaw to replace him. Keep in mind that Shaw was not on the Supreme Judicial Court. He was not on any court. He wasn't a judge. He was just a lawyer in Boston. Shaw didn't want to do it, mostly because of the considerable cut in pay. Uh, so a gentleman named Daniel Webster was dispatched to him to try to talk him into it. Which he did. And uh, Shaw became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court at the age of 49, which is the perfect age to become a judge of any kind. And he served as the Chief, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court from 1830 to 1860. He was the most influential state court judge in the 19th century America. Uh, a lot of his cases have to do uh, with railroads and corporations and that kind of stuff. Uh, not heavy fodder for a talk, but I'll probably eventually be reduced to doing that. Um, plus, I uh, recall Shaw's tragic engagement to Nancy Rose Miller. His daughter, Shaw's daughter Elizabeth, usually called Lizzie, married Nancy Melville's nephew, Herman Melville. Uh, and uh, that worked out well for Melville because Shaw sort of became a walking ATM. <laughs> <laughs> now, as a state representative in 1811, Shaw described slavery as quote, one continued series of tremendous crimes. Uh, he also said it was a great and acknowledged evil, but it was too much part, too much ingrained into society and the American economy, in his view, to be what he called speedily eradicated. Uh, doing that, in his view, and the view of a lot of people, uh, would devastate the enslaved population themselves and it would ravage the economy of the slave holding states. And uh, his hope, the hope of men, was that these slave holding states in the South would plan to gradually eliminate slavery. Uh, and if not, if that did not occur in Shaw's view, there would result a great national calamity. Now, as we've noted, the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights in 1780 declared all men free and equal. But the United States Constitution, 1789, includes compromises, notably with slaveholding states, and that was thought necessary to keep the Union bound together. The terms slave Slavery you know, do not appear in the U.S. Constitution, uh, but the so-called fugitive, fugitive slave clause, Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3, provided that a person, quote, held to service or labor, unquote, who escapes from one state to another must be surrendered back to the state from which they have fled. 
Uh, yes, that applied to indentured servitude. But let's just say that two South Carolina delegates who pushed that language, uh, one of them owned more than 100 enslaved people, and that sounds like a lot. Uh, the other one owned more than 1,000 enslaved people. One of the largest slaveholders in the United States. Uh, those were Charles Pinckney and Pierce Butler. So there's the clause, it's right there in the Constitution, but there was no enforcement mechanism. So Congress passed in 1793 the Fugitive Slave Act to provide that mechanism. This uh, statute empowered slaveholders to use the federal courts and local magistrates, city, town, county, to regain possession of runaways. The procedure was summary. There was certainly no jury trial. There was no trial at all contemplated. There was, there was no way that the enslaved person could testify on his or her own behalf. Uh, that's not shocking, really, because uh, even throughout the 19th century, criminal defendants could not testify on their own behalf in Massachusetts. Uh, if the person were found to be an escaped slave, a certificate would issue. It was essentially a warrant to remove the state, the slave, from the state to which the slave had fled. Uh, additionally, that statute provided that children of fugitive enslaved mothers were automatically enslaved. And anyone interfering with the seizure of an enslaved person faced a $500 fine. And I imagine interfered with was probably interpreted pretty poor. Antebellum Boston, where Shaw heard cases, was famously the epicenter of abolitionism. The north slope of Beacon Hill was the city, uh, the center of the city's black community. Uh, it had a slang term that was not that genteel. The buildings that you see in blue were owned by black, free black people. Uh, the abolitionist activist spirit there uh, in the North North Slope of Beacon Hill uh, kind of was paralleled or did parallel such fervent white abolitionists as William Lloyd Garrison, who was able, unlike uh, many black people, to trumpet his the cause of abolitionism in a newspaper. This was called the Liberator. Um, but however enlightened Boston was regarding slavery, uh, there was another side. The other side considered abolitionists rabid revolutionaries, threatening public order, threatening the unity of the nation, and last but not least, threatening money. Raw cotton was grown and harvested in the South by the enslaved population there. It was spun into cotton cloth here. And much of the wealth of the upper echelon of Boston, its social, its business leaders, uh, some of whom were on the other side uh, of the Hill, as Shaw eventually did, uh, the separation is going to be Pinckney Street, derived from cotton manufacture. Uh, they were called uh, cotton wigs, or uh, constitutional unionists. To them, to them, slavery down there in the South, where we don't really see it. Uh, it was unpleasant, maybe it was evil, but it was justified by the Constitution and by the cause of maintaining the union. And again, not uh, incidentally, source of income. Uh, Shaw can be fought among that number. Uh, one writer has said that in Shaw's mind, Slavery was inseparable 
from the very idea and existence of the nation. This, this picture illustrates one of the other great things about Shaw, uh, and that is that throughout his life, his hair was brown, and he kept all of it. Don't worry, I thought. Uh, especially after the Ben Franklin comment. In the, the first slavery case that Shaw was involved in was was called Common Law versus Howard. Uh, it was an unreported case. Official report cases that come down from various courts, Supreme Judicial Court, uh, were reported in books like this. Uh, and, uh, so, and they're called the Massachusetts Reports. So uh, this one is from well, a little later than that. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. There's a case in there that I'm talking about. Uh, anyway, that's the difference between the reported case and the reported case. A woman named Mrs. Howard of Cuba came to Boston and she brought, brought with her a boy about 12 years old, maybe 14 years old, named Francisco, whom she purchased in Havana. Uh, they served upon her uh, a writ of habeas corpus, which brought her and Francisco into court. But these were these uh, actions were almost uniformly brought by anti-slavery uh, uh, abolitionist societies in Boston. Uh, once in, the, in court, Mrs. Howard denied that Francisco was an enslaved person. She characterized him as a servant, but he was free. Apparently there was some evidence suggesting the contrary. Uh, but Shaw questioned Francisco privately. Brought him back in the lobby and, uh, and, and talked to him. And Francisco told Shaw that he wanted to stay with Mrs. Howard. And Shaw reportedly signaled, again, in the reported case, except in the newspapers, that if this is Howard, had claimed that Francisco was a slave, Shaw would have freed him. Another unreported case uh, involving Shaw arose in August 1836 after the Supreme Judicial Court had moved into the courthouse on the Court Street in Boston that had been uh, built that year. This building is no longer there. It was 29 in 1909. Uh, but just for uh, historical context, I guess, the Superior Court House here in Barcelona Village, easy to walk from here, was built right around that same time, and maybe a little earlier, early 1830s. Not as early as this one, but still early. Uh, this, this case, the one we're about to uh, talk about for a moment, was the first and probably the least known of several cases featuring dramatic rescues of fear of an uproar caused by such an event in or around the courthouse. And what happened here was uh, a ship called the Chickasaw uh, came into Boston Harbor. Uh, the captain of that ship was holding on board two um, black women one named Eliza Small and another one named Polly Ann Bates. And the agent of the person who supposedly owned them in Maryland uh, had come to claim them as property. That's the way they always work. The, the actual owner never came up. They had sent them out. And so there's another habeas corpus here. Uh, habeas corpus, everybody know that means? Essentially, bringing the body kind of from Shirley Valley. There were hundreds of sympathizers at that hearing involving these two ladies. And most of them were women, and they were in the courthouse. Oh. And Shaw decided pretty rapidly that this captain, this captain of this vessel, the Chickasaw, had no authority 
to detain these women, and he ordered them free. And uh, apparently they kind of were a little bit shocked. Well, that's good stuff, but didn't really see it coming quite that quickly. And so they stood there, and the agent of the owner uh, stood up unhappily and announced that he would make a fresh arrest for them under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, and he was asking Shaw if he needed to acquire a new warrant to do that. And right around that time, uh, some of the people in the courthouse suggested to these two men that they were free, leave the courthouse, and went back. Uh, leave now. So uh, there were shouts of take them, there were shouts of go, go, and what became known as the an abolitionist riot erupted. Uh, people trying to block them, but most people trying to get them out of the room. Shaw reportedly clambered down from his bench and physically tried to hold the door against agitated multitudes trying to enter the courtroom. And that gives a whole new meaning to the phrase judicial activism. Now exactly what he did, exactly what Shaw did, how much peril he actually put himself into are unknown, but he, it sounds, and on that occasion at least, he was pretty agile for a man uh, that one historian later called, quote, an alarming mountainous presence. He sat like a great warty toad <laughs> at the center of the bench embodying in his bulk the very weight of justice. Uh, totally a little much. I think that message could have gotten across without giving you a toad. Uh, anyway, uh, these ladies, small and Bates, uh, they bolted from the courthouse. They were piled into a waiting carriage, and they were galloped out of town. The carriage crossed the uh, Boston and Roxbury Mill Dam, which was a toll. The toll money was just thrown out of the carriage. Uh, no one was ever charged for taking place in this alleged riot. Uh, the British Empire, including Canada, had abolished slavery two years before in the Slavery Abolition Act. Uh, Small and Bates eventually reached Halifax, Nova Scotia. And later that very same month, August 1836, a woman named Mary Slater arrived in Boston to visit her father, Thomas Davis. And she planned to stay up here for four or five months or so, and she brought with her uh, an enslaved girl known as Ned, who was about six years old. Uh, so under Louisiana law, Slater owned Ned. Uh, while in Boston, Ned was in Avis's custody, uh, this is Slater's father, uh, for a few days. Uh, Mary had absented herself from the city for a couple of days because of some kind of health issue. And so a Avis uh, became Slater's representative agent as to as to that. Another writ of habeas corpus, uh, again instigated by abolitionists, and uh, this case became a reported case called Commonwealth versus Avis. And the issue in this case was can an enslaved person brought into Massachusetts for a temporary stay be deprived of liberty while here? then taken out of Massachusetts against his or her consent. Uh, abolitionist hired a famed lawyer, Rufus Cho, who's, uh, I guess they say it up there, uh, in the Adams Courthouse in Boston, that statue, statue, not statue, statue, 
And when you go up the stairs in there, you know, you want to tell them it's good to be like Some people. Or every day. Um, anyway, so they hired Cho, and he was joined by abolitionist lawyers Ellis Ray Warren, who was the mentor to Robert Morris, who we'll be able to get to in a few minutes, and Samuel Sewell, Samuel Edwin Sewell. Uh, Samuel Sewell's great, great grandfather, also named Samuel Sewell, uh, was one of the Salem Woods judges. The only one to publicly repent for his participation in that episode. But he was also the author of the earliest anti-slavery tract in what would become the United States. It's called The Selling of Joseph, and that was published in 1700. Now defending the slaveholding Avis was the lawyer named Benjamin R. Curtis. In 1851, Curtis would join the United States Supreme Court. And when that court decided the infamous Dred Scott decision in 1857, Dred, called Dred Scott versus Sanford, uh, that's the case uh, where uh, the opinion was written by Chief Justice Roger Portani of Maryland, and uh, the case decided that uh, black people are just not citizens of the country. They just don't have any rights at all in the Constitution. Curtis wrote a 67 page dissent to his federalism credit. Now, Shaw's decision in the Avis case recognizes slavery as odious, uh, and he goes again to the Massachusetts Constitution, uh, which confers freedom and equal status on all men, and he said that plainly applied to slavery. In fact, he thought, it's hard, quote, to select words more precisely adapted to the abolition of Negro slavery. Now, nevertheless, he observed, slavery is not contrary to the laws of civilized nations. But because it is so odious, it can only be acknowledged by positive law. There's got to be a statue recognizing a name on it. And he said there is no such law in Massachusetts. So he's going through all these uh, uh, analyses, uh, these uh, spinning these uh, theories. But what the case boiled down to is that the Fugitive Slave Act did not apply to men. She was not a fugitive slave. She was brought here. Shaw ordered her to be freed. And then the, the wheels can start turning, well, what does that mean for a six-year-old girl to be free? Uh, well, uh, abolitionist women um, assumed custody of Ned. They renamed her Maria Somerset uh, after uh, and then a very influential uh, abolitionist in Boston and the very influential English slavery case, Somerset. Uh, but Med Maria died in Samaritan Asylum for Indigent Children, some call, sometimes called the Asylum for Colored Orphans, before she reached the age of eight. Uh, she might have been, in some speculation, she might have been killed before she even left New Orleans. Her mother and her siblings had remained in Louisiana. And while Ned was alive, abolitionists in Boston had argued that simple human decency would require that her mother and her siblings be free to join her here in Massachusetts. And that didn't happen. Now, many in the South castigated Shaw's opinion. Uh, while abolitionists sang it, praised it. And William Lloyd Garrison cheered, quote, the rational, just, and noble decision of this eminent judge. But that kind of a 
Revelation ignored Shaw's clear signal. Had Meg been a fugitive, the outcome would have been different. Uh, that point was repeated in another case in 1845, uh, 1844 rather, involving uh, an enslaved gentleman named Robert Lucas, who was acting as a servant to uh, his Virginian master who was on board the naval frigate United States. The year before, 1843, Herman Melville signed on to that vessel in Hawaii, uh, and it reached Boston in October of 1844. Lucas, uh, the son of Robert Lucas, actually inspired uh, a noble character in his novel, White Jack, a character named Guinea, written in 1850. And so that's 1844, and uh, Melville became Shaw's son-in-law in 1847. In his decision regarding Robert Lucas, Shaw laid it out. Where a slave is in Massachusetts casually, not being a runaway, whether he is brought here voluntarily by his master or not, there is no law here to authorize his restraint. Lucas was free. Sturgis and Bryant. 
so William Stowe was born you know, 150 yards up the way. You can't get any more candy bars. <laughs> so uh, Morris was originally from Sale. He was the second black lawyer in the Commonwealth, uh, which made him among the first black attorneys in the country. Uh, he was the first black lawyer to try a jury case uh, in which he prevailed. Shaw's own involvement here was refusing, as the Fusion Slave Act provided, to issue habeas corpus. Uh, and that was taken as a signal that the statute was constitutional. In other words, it didn't allow a, an argument regarding the Constitution Slave Act in the UK. Uh, again, large crowd gathers at that courthouse, good 200 people at least. Uh, and they exploded into Paul, Charlie Sandwood, led by this abolitionist, who escaped, who himself had escaped from slavery. Uh, Shadrack, uh, Shadrack was arrested from the marshals who had him uh, taken away down there. Uh, he escaped into the street. He was hidden in the Beacon Hill attic. And this rapist was immediately termed the Negro insurrection in Boston. I remember Daniel Webster. Um, by then he was the Secretary of State of the country, and he said that what these people had done was treason. Shad Ratko headed north, settled in Montreal. The same month that uh, Shad Rack uh, disappeared in the of uh, uh, Mr. Shad Rack, February 18. One, Thomas Sims escaped slavery in Georgia by stowing away on a Boston bound ship. And he was held in custody in the ruined courthouse for federal matters of war. The city by this time was intent on avoiding another so called insurrection. They stationed 100 to 200 police officers around the courthouse and they literally wrapped the building in chains. I guess nobody saw the irony in that, but... <laughs> uh, entry into the courthouse, supposed to be public, of course, uh, strictly regulated. Uh, those people who did enter the courthouse had to go through, uh, go through the doors, had to crouch and stoop underneath these chains. Uh, Shaw did it which earned him considerable ridicule from Richard Henry Daniel Jr. Uh, inside the courthouse, Shaw again, as he had done with Shadrach, uh, refused to issue a writ of his corpus. Ralph Waldo Emerson lamented in his journal, what a moment was lost. Sims ended up returned to Georgia, he was uh, reportedly savagely whipped by his owner in Georgia, and he was sold to another owner in Mississippi. Um, and uh, that didn't end up happily, obviously, for him. He didn't get to Montreal or Halifax. The most well-known Fugitive Slave Act case would come to be Anthony Burns. That was in 1854. Uh, that involved riots and Marines. No Shaw involvement, so we move on. In April 1847, the father of a four-year-old girl who lived on Andover Street, on the side of Pekin Hill, uh, applied, tried several times to enroll her in the school nearest to her house. That application was denied because Sarah C. Roberts was black. Uh, the petition was taken up the committee chain in Boston and back, consistently denied. In February 1848, Sarah went into the school nearest her home with a tick without a ticket of admission, which you had to have. She was ejected. Uh, one of the two black schools in the city, it was called the Abel Smith School, it was on uh, Belknap Street, now Joy Street, still there, as a matter of fact, was 2,100 feet from the Roberts home. There were five other schools on streets that connected with that direct route. 
Benjamin F. Roberts. Her father refused to have Sarah attend the Smith School. The black community of Boston had opinion, had supported black schools, but that support had waned as it became clear that the schools themselves were becoming dilapidated, that is, the schools for the black students, and the curriculum different considerably. The Boston Primary School Committee oversaw 161 primary schools in Boston, schools for kids aged 4 to 7. Uh, petitions to that committee to desegregate Boston's primary grammar schools in the 1840s failed. Its response to a uh, petition in 1848 was that black school children's, quote, peculiar physical, mental, and moral structure requires an educational treatment different in some respects from that of a white child. Now, there was a statute in 1845 that said if any child were unlawfully excluded from public school instruction, that child could recover damages from the offending city or town through a suit in the child's name. When Sarah was ejected from that school, her father, Benjamin Roberts, consulted Robert Morris. Uh, now, remember, pioneering black attorney Robert Morris, he now becomes the first lawyer in the United States to file a civil rights case challenging segregation in public schools. And to assist him, uh, Morris engaged Charles Sumner. Uh, Sumner then was a private practice lawyer and a towering figure. And literally, he was six foot four, and figuratively, in the cause of abolitionism. Both at this time and during his 23 years in the Senate, uh, he was known for what happened to him after he gave a powerful speech against the slave power in 1856. Uh, a few days later, Representative Preston Brooks confronted Sumner at Sumner's Senate desk, and before Sumner could rise, Brooks began beating his head with a heavy cane and blinding Sumner with his own blood. Sumner was gravely injured physically and psychologically, and he did not return to the U.S. Senate for three years. Um, but Massachusetts kept that seat open. Uh, it must well known about Charles Sumner, another Cape Cod connection, tale, another tale of Cape Cod, as it were. Sumner married a woman named Alice Mason Hooper, who was the granddaughter of William Sturgis. Uh, this woman was high spirited. And uh, within months of her marrying Charles Sumner, she was seen way too frequently being squired around Washington, D.C. by a Prussian diplomat called Friedrich von Holstein. And uh, while they were separated, Sumner, they became separated as a result of uh, this continuing. Uh, Seen in Washington, Sumner's political enemies began calling him the Great Impotency. Not as bad as, well, maybe this. I was thinking Toad, but. <laughs> uh, so the Roberts matter was heard in November of 1849. Um, Sarah was now six years old. A little more than three weeks later, Harvard Medical School professor John Layton Webster murdered and dismembered George Parkman. Uh, this is the son that I've spoken about, I think, here, uh, at Harvard Medical School. Shaw would provide over that uh, very early trial and write an influential opinion about such topics as reasonable doubt. Going back, though, to this case, Sumner's argument in Roberts echoed one that had three long debt from slavery almost 70 years before. The equality of man 
mankind and, uh, was established in the Massachusetts Constitution. And the legislation establishing public schools did not empower a school committee to brand a whole race with the stigma of inferiority and degradation. Doing that was unreasonable and therefore not allowed. Now, Sumner might not have used the exact phrase separate but equal, but that's exactly what he was arguing against. A black school could not be equivalent to a white school because a black school would impose upon its students inconveniences and a stigma of caste on those children. They, black children, he emphasized, were entitled to precise equality. And some went on to argue, uh, raising points that sound remarkably modern, that white people are also harmed by segregation. Uh, white children are thereby taught to deny what some have called the brotherhood of man. And that hardens their hearts. And he said, quote, prejudice is the child of ignorance. It is sure to prevail where people do not know each other. Uh, arguing for the city of Boston was a, a, solicit a, a solicitor and municipal law specialist named P. A. W. Chandler. Shaw was uh, not swayed by Sumner's morality-centered position. And he apparently adopted much of Chandler's argument. This is a bit of a I'm sure it's in the Sturgis Library. Uh, Shaw recognized Sumner's point about people being equal before the law, but that, quote, great principle was unrealistic in application. Now, men and women do not have both the same civil and political powers, and children and adults are not subject to what they call the same treatment. Now, all the equality really meant was that the rights of all people are, quote, entitled to the paternal consideration and protection of the law for their maintenance and security. Rights depend on laws. Shaw conceded that black people are entitled to equal rights. The question is whether a regulation that provide, provided a separate school for black uh, children violated any of those rights. And he concluded that the school committee had the power to regulate the education system in Boston unless that power were abused or perverted. And in his view, it had not been. Uh, he ended by suggesting that Sarah's having to walk far to the school, not unreasonable. But before that, he addressed Sumner's argument that segregation perpetuated both the odious distinction of caste, founded in a deep, rooted principle in public opinion. If that prejudice exists, Shaw declared, in a well-known phrase, it is not created by law and probably cannot be changed by law. Uh, on that point, he was correct, at least in the sense that separate but equal was solidified by him in his Roberts case. And it was one of the authorities relied upon by the United States Supreme Court 47 years later in a case called Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. In 1892, Homer Adolph Plessy volunteered to be a plaintiff in a test case challenging what was called the Louisiana Separate Car Act, creating railway cars for whites only. In the neurotically stratified world of uh, New Orleans' view of race, uh, Plessy was an octoroon. He was one-eighth black. So, uh, he was very light-skinned. Uh, by the way, I only found out recently that the father of Russian literature, Alexander Pushkin, 
also a woman, but, uh, but that's why he was chosen. Uh, plus, I keep going like this, like he's up there. That's not him. You go on the internet and try to find a picture of Roman Plus, and you're going to be disappointed. You're going to find a picture of this distinguished gentleman, but it's not him. Uh, plus, he was charged with violating the Civil Court Act. He appeared before Judge John Howard Ferguson, as he was Ferguson, Ferguson uh, who I mentioned because he's the Ferguson in the style of the case, and he was from Chilmark. Uh, case finally got to the United States Supreme Court. Segregation is legal as long as black people and white people have equal facilities, which they did. Uh, and that rolling stood for 60 years until Brown versus Board of Education versus Topeka in 1954. Actually, there were a number of uh, cases joined there. But the Brown, in that case, was Linda Carol Brown and her father, Oliver Brown. Uh, she couldn't attend the school closest to her home, which was in the ninth Board of Meetings, just like Sarah Roberts. The court ruled unanimously that racial segregation in public schools violated the 14th Amendment. Separate but equal was unconstitutional. The court declared in 1954 to separate black children from others of similar age and qualifications solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely to ever be undone. What happened to Sarah Roberts, no one knows. Uh, Homer Plessy was pardoned in Louisiana for the crime that he had to plead to in January of this year. People are descendants of Plessy and Ferguson. Uh, Linda Brown became a teacher, a speaker, an advocate. She died in 2018. Back to Shaw. This is Shaw as uh, a Roman emperor. <laughs> this bust is right down the road in the court, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, Shaw retired from the bench in August 1860. Seven months later, he died of a stroke in Boston at the age of 80. 13 years, he's buried in uh, Mount Auburn in Cambridge, a lot of time. 13 days later, 13 days after Confederate forces fired artillery on Fort Sumter, igniting, quote, the great national calamity that Shaw feared if the South did not eliminate slavery. Thank you. Thank you.